the right atrium is responsible to receive blood coming from the from all the body, right? But the blood that comes from the top part of your of your of your body, right, from your shoulders and up, drops into the right vena cava, right? So where does the blood come from or go through uh, from the lower part? So in the back part, okay, you have your inferior vena cava. Your inferior vena cava is the one that collects blood from the lower part of the body, gets pumped in here, and then joins in here with your uh, superior vena cava, and then comes in here into your right atrium. So again, the right atrium is responsible to collect all the blood that is coming from all of your body, including your upper and your lower body, okay? Your atria will receive blood and it contracts, okay? It will contract as it's receiving the blood, it's filling with blood, okay? And when enough pressure builds in there, when there's enough pressure, okay, the little valves, this one, these are called a tricuspid valve. Tri for three, cuspid is for a C. So tricuspid valves, they're right here, they open. When, too, when enough pressure builds, the tricuspid valves will open and allow the blood to flow into the right ventricle, all right, into the right ventricle. So that's what happens, right? So it builds and it contracts and pushes the blood into the right ventricle, okay? So once the, the blood flows into the right ventricle, it's gonna build pressure there again, the right ventricle, this part is filling and filling and filling, and then it's going to contract and push the blood to the lungs, right? Through the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arteries, okay? Now you can't see them here. They're, they're lo located here in the back part, okay? So it goes, it's gonna be the right ventricle pushes the blood through here, through the right um, uh, pulmonary arteries, okay? Pulmonary means lung. So the blood is gonna be pushed into the lungs, okay? By the right ventricle. So again, we have blood that is deoxygenated. There's no oxygen in it, right? In the, in the veins, you have blood that only has carbon dioxide, which is what we excel. The cells in your body produce carbon dioxide. So all that waste is picked up, pushed by the blood back into the heart, into the heart, into the right atrium, then into the right, into the right uh, uh, atri uh, ventricle, and then pushed into the lungs where they're going to go and uh, exchange gases. So you're gonna see um, the blood being pumped to the lungs, right? It's going to go to exchange gases. Now in the lungs, when you, uh, the blood goes into the lungs, it go, goes into the capillaries of the lungs. It doesn't go just into fills the, 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 uh, the lungs with blood. It, no, because that's where you have your, your air, right? Your, your, your lungs expand and they collect air. So where does it, uh, the, the exchange happens? It, it happens in a very small sacs called the alveoli. In the lungs, we have very small sacs called alveoli, and this is where the capillary uh, gas exchange happens. So if you hear about people that smoke a lot, uh, the capillaries in the alveoli are the ones that get uh, ruined or destroyed with all the nicotine that people are smoking. So it ruins the lungs, and then obviously in the long run, they develop uh, uh, respiratory conditions like COPD and emphysema. But anyways, so once the blood goes into the lungs, collects oxygen and we exhale CO2, it has to come back to the heart, okay? It's gonna come back through the heart, through the pulmonary veins, pulmonary veins. Now, I just said that the veins carry deoxygenated blood from the body, okay? But this is the only part of the body where veins carry oxygenated blood, okay? So again, the, the blood is gonna come back to the left atrium, all right? through uh, the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins are going to fill the left atrium with oxygenated blood, okay? And again, pressure builds up, builds up, builds up, and then the left atrium is going to contract, push the blood into the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is going to start to fill and expands and expands and expands, all right? and contracts, and then it's going to push the blood out through the aorta, through the aortic valves, and into the rest of your body, 
okay? You can see all the, uh, the arteries where they branch off and it goes to your head and to the left and to the right and then to the bottom and so on. So there's a lot of, um, this is what we call the, the cardiac cycle, all right? A lot of blood flow, a lot of movement going on around in your heart at this time as we're speaking and it's moving around with us having to worry about anything, all right? But we do have to, you know, again, treat your heart right, uh, eat well, eat a balanced meal, uh, avoid a lot of sugars. It's uh, the main problem. And uh, avoid a lot of sugars and your heart will be just fine. Just cut down on sugars. That's all you have to do. Okay, so again, we're going to watch a little video here in a minute uh, about the cardiac cycle. And hopefully you can understand, uh, start, understand it well because it, it is going to depend, uh, your understanding of that cardiac cycle is going to affect a lot of your, um, uh, your understanding of, of the, uh, it coincides with the EKG. All right, and that's why you have to know uh, the anatomy of the heart. Now, again, the valves that are going to hear, you have the tricuspid valves on, located on your right um, atrium and between your right atrium and your right ventricle, okay? On the left side, you have your bicuspid valves, two bis, two bicuspid valves between your left atrium and your left ventricle. Now, you have the aortic valve, which is the one that uh, separates your left ventricle and your aorta, okay? Remember, these valves are there to prevent blood from going back where it came from. That's all they're doing, okay? And of course, you have your uh, pulmonary or um, valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, okay? The right, the right uh, ventricle pushes blood into the lungs. Well, between that, you have your pulmonary uh, valves, which keep blood from going back into there, okay? So it's important that blood is always flowing in one direction and then back into the heart, right? To the lungs and back into the heart. So it's important that these valves work perfectly because if they don't, then people start to develop uh, conditions such as uh, mitral valve uh, reflux and uh, blood flows back into the ventricle and, and so on. It becomes a problem, very severe problem. So get familiar with the valves, okay? I'm gonna be testing you when we meet on the anatomy of the heart. So make sure that you know it pretty well, all right? All right. So the major vessels uh, to and from the heart, again, your aorta. This is the one that pumps blood to the body and your inferior, uh, superior vena cava. And of course, in the bottom, you have your uh, inferior vena cava. Superior and inferior vena cava. These are the ones that collect the blood uh, going, uh, coming in from the body. Does anyone have any questions so far? All right. Uh, so let's move on, okay? If y'all don't have any questions, that means that y'all understand. So I'm gonna start asking you questions, okay? So either you ask me or I'm gonna ask you. Okay, I'm going to share with you something real quick. Can y'all see this? Let me make it bigger. Can y'all see it? The heart. Yes. Blood through two different but interconnected vascular systems. The smaller of these systems is the pulmonary system. Blood returning from the upper part of the body is delivered to the right atrium of the heart by the superior vena cava, one of the body's two largest veins while blood returning from the lower part of the body is delivered to the right atrium by the other major vein, the inferior vena cava. Contraction of the right atrium in each cardiac cycle forces blood into the right ventricle. This is followed by contraction of the right ventricle, which pumps blood into the pulmonary artery, sending it on through the blood vessels of the lungs. As the right ventricle contracts and pressure within the right ventricle rises, the tricuspid valve situated at the opening between the right atrium and right ventricle shuts, preventing any backflow. The pressure
pressure generated by contraction of the right ventricle soon opens the pulmonary valve and blood enters the circulation of the lungs. After passing through the circulation of the lungs, the blood, having been recharged with oxygen and having rid itself of carbon dioxide, is returned through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. The left atrium, too, contracts, forwarding blood into the left ventricle in order to fill it before it contracts. As the powerful left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve shuts, preventing backflow into the left atrium. The aortic valve opens, and blood is forced into the aorta, which distributes it to the rest of the body apart from the lungs. As the contraction comes to an end and pressure in the aorta falls, the aortic valve snaps shut to prevent backflow into the left ventricle. All right. That was a very to the point. All right, so let me call you out one at a time. Okay, Ms. Janie, where does the blood, um, when it comes to the heart, what are the major vessels where the heart goes into? What are those vessels called? The arteries? Nope. The two major vessels, these blue ones, these are colored blue, right? The veins are usually color, colored blue. What's the name of this one and this one, the bottom one? Anybody help her out here? There we have a top one and we have a bottom one. What are they called? Come on guys. You have your, uh, your book there. Um, you should know that they're called the inferior and superior vena cava. All right. So once the blood makes it into into the the right uh, this chamber, what is this chamber called, Raquel? What do you call this chamber, where the blood, the deoxygenated blood, goes into? What is it called? Is it the right atrium? correct that is the right atrium very good okay so the right atrium is going to fill with blood okay and it's going to push blood to the right ventricle what is the name of this valve right here cynthia what is the name of this valve type your answer while you type your answer there the blood is going to go into the lower chamber what is that uh, chamber called uh, ms norma What is the chamber on the right side of the heart, the lower chamber called? Anyone, Janie or Raquel, can you tell me the name of this chamber right here? The left ventricle? Nope, we're still on the right side. So you call it the right? Ventricle. The right ventricle, yes. Uh, Cynthia, these are the tricuspid valves. Okay, tri is three, there's three little valves, right? Oh, well, actually they're called uh, tri because there's three muscles that, that open it and close it. If you saw the video closely, uh, you have like little ligaments and tendons. Okay, the tendons, uh, they call the cord, uh, cord, chordae tendinae or something like that. Uh, there's very small uh, muscles that, um, that help this valve open and close. And same thing on the left side of the mitral valves, okay? So those, those uh, tendons, guys, are um, very delicate. They're sensitive to some medications. Uh, I know in, the, in um, a while back when I was at the hospital, uh, I had uh, in my care a young lady, she must have been in her 30s at the point, and she came in here complain of chest pain, of chest pain. A 30-year-old, 20, 30-year-old doesn't usually complain of chest pain. So right away, uh, pretty much we suspected, you know, what she was experiencing. And she was, uh, uh, we knew it was going to be like the mitral valves on this side, on the left side. The mitral valves have been damaged uh, be because she had been taking um, uh, ephedrine or some diet pills. So there's a lot of people out there that take diet pills, medications from other countries that, you know, that can sell them. Uh, they're not for sale here, but so they damages the, those those tendons 
and the valves themselves. Remember, the valves are muscles. They're like sphincters that open and close. And uh, some medications can damage them. So if you take medications without knowing, uh, you can actually cause damage to, your, to the valves or tendons of the heart. Okay, so the blood is going to fill the right ventricle. It's going to be pushed to the lungs. What is the name of the valves, Cynthia? The valve that separates the right ventricle and the lungs or the pulmonary arteries. What is the name of that valve? Type your answer there, okay? Um, Raquel, what is the purpose of blood going to the lungs? What is the purpose of blood going to the lungs? So it can be oxygenated. All right, yes, it's gonna pick up oxygen, but also at the same time it's gonna do what? There's, there's two reasons. Pick up oxygen and get rid of what? Carbon dioxide. Okay, remember that, carbon dioxide. So in our lungs, we have carbon dioxide and we have oxygen, right? They're pretty, pretty even, all right? Uh, sometimes when people start to hyperventilate, right? When they're tired or they're having shortness of breath, and you know, uh, they start to uh, get rid of too much CO2 too fast, it creates an imbalance and people get dizzy and lightheaded, right? Just, just for that simple reason, okay? Uh, yes, Cynthia, you're correct. The valve that separates the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery is called obviously the pulm pulmonic or pulmonary valves, okay? Again, the point of the valves is to keep blood from coming back into the, into the chamber it was, it, it was sent from. So, uh, blood goes to the uh, to the lungs, picks up oxygen, gets rid of CO2, and it's going to come back to the left side of the heart through what vessels? What is the name of the vessels that bring blood back to the left side of the heart? What is it? Janie, tell me, Janie. I know you know the answer, Janie. What is the name of the, um, of the vessel that brings blood back to the left side of the heart? If you know the answer, you can type it in there or we can wait for Janie to give us the answer. Type in your answer if you know it. All right, so it comes back to the left side of the heart to that vessel, and then it's gonna go into the left what, Raquel? What, what is the left chamber where the, that receives blood, oxygenated blood? Where is it, right here, this little one? The, the left. left atrium. Left atrium is correct. The left atrium is correct, very good. Now this left atrium again is gonna fill with blood and then it's gonna create pressure and push blood through what valve, Cynthia? What is the name of the valve, Cynthia? This one. You already told me you have tricuspid on the right, you have pulmonic over here, right? And then this one is called the... It has two names, okay? You can call it Two is what? Mitral valve or bicuspid, that's correct. Bicuspid or mitral valve, whichever one helps you, it's easy for you to remember because I know sometimes tricuspid and then bicuspid over here and it gets a little bit confusing. If you call it mitral valve, it's the same thing, okay? So the mitral valves are going to open from the pressure that builds up in, in the left atrium, push blood into what? What is this one called, Norma? The left? The left what? The left ventricle. The left ventricle is correct. So this is the larger part. This this is the larger part of the heart, okay? It's the bigger muscle that does most of the work for us, right? Every single second of our lives. And it's gonna build up and create pressure, 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 pressure. And then it's gonna push the blood through what vessel? I mean, through what valve, Cynthia? You're the valve lady here. What is the name of the valve that opens up when the pressure builds up here. Aortic is correct, very good. The aortic valve opens up and then the blood gushes in through what the name of this vessel, uh, Raquel, this big red one. What is the name of this vessel? Is it the aortic semi lunar? <laughs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> it's just the aorta, okay? It's just the aorta. 
Cynthia gave us the name for the valve that's right here. They separates the aorta and the left ventricle. It's called the aortic valve, right? So the uh, a ventricle pushes the blood through the aortic valve and then it closes. So the blood doesn't come back. So, and it goes out to the rest of the body and the cycle repeats itself over and over and over, okay? So it's really, really important that you know that cycle because if anything goes wrong with that cycle, anything um, that stops it from completing, okay, where it affects the, the cycle in some way, it, it, you're going to have problems, okay? If you have a condition, it's gonna, you're going to have problems, all right? So I think you all have a good idea now of what the cardiac cycle is. Uh, so we have, you can think of it in, in three different uh, ways, okay? We have your pulmonary circulation, which is the blood that goes to the lungs, okay? Through the pulmonary arteries and then the, returns through the pulmonary veins. What happens in there, right? What oxygen gets picked up, CO2 gets, you know, get rid of it and so on. You also have your systemic, systemic circulation. Systemic circulation is pretty much all of your body, all right? All of your body. Uh, your systemic circulation is pumped by the heart. That's pretty much all there is to it. And then you have your coronary circulation. Your coronary circulation refers to the circulation in the heart itself, right? You can see this little uh, art arteries and veins that are over here and over here, right? This is the blood that receives from the heart itself. So the heart pumps blood to itself, okay? So that the muscle can be you know, nourished, right? With blood and continue to function. Okay, so the coronary circulation is one thing. We have pulmonary circulation in your lungs, and then you also have circulation that goes through all your body, which is systemic, okay? They're all interrelated, guys. They're all interrelated. If there's a lack of blood flow to the heart, like if you're having a heart attack, okay, and artery is clogged and the muscle senses the, the lack of oxygen, okay, uh, what it's gonna do is, is it's gonna start to pump the, the muscle, the heart, it pumps harder and harder to deliver blood here. And what does that affect? Can somebody tell me what, how your body is affected? How is it affected? Well, it's going to affect your systemic circulation, your systemic circulation. Now your blood pressure is up. If we measure it, we're like, oh my God, your blood pressure is super high. Why? Well, because there's a lack of blood flow here and your heart is sensing that change and it's trying to pump harder so that, uh, so that it can deliver blood to itself. And now, but you're feeling right. And then the person says, oh, I don't feel good. I feel nauseated. I have a headache. And I feel like my heart wants to pop out of my chest. And, you know, they feel the symptoms. And we're like, well, your blood pressure is up, sir. But why is it consistently up? What's the problem? All right. What I've found from experience uh, is that um, when somebody has heart disease, coronary artery disease, and they don't know it yet, okay, uh, what happens is that uh, their blood pressure tends to go higher and higher and higher and it stays high. It's very difficult to lower it. Why? Because the heart knows what to do. The only thing it knows what to do is to pump harder every time, harder and harder until the, the, the needs are met here or in the lungs or wherever the shortage is. All the heart knows to do is to pump. Okay, so let's move on. So the heart is a pump, right? It's an amazing, an amazing muscle tissue it beats about an average 72 times and it uh, it uh, creates cardiac output okay what is the formula to me to uh, calculate cardiac output i i gave it to you all yesterday what is the formula Cynthia, do you remember type it in what is the formula to calculate cardiac output uh jane do you remember what is the average amount of blood uh, the stroke volume with every contraction on average. What is the average stroke volume? Every time your left ventricle contracts, it pushes how much blood out of to your body? If you don't remember, it's about 70 milliliters. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you, uh, Janie. 70 mLs on average for everybody. That is your stroke volume for everybody. Mine on average, okay? Mine, yours, and every other adult. And then you multiply it times your heart rate. So if you do that right now, you can figure out what is your um, cardiac output. Cardiac output is what it's all about, okay? If somebody is not having enough cardiac output, they're gonna feel the symptoms, right? Not enough blood flow. 
Take, for example, if you start working out, right, you haven't worked out in ages, right? Now, all of a sudden, you decide to, uh, to start, you know, exercising. Of course, you're in terrible shape. Your heart is not able to keep up with you. So you're going to start to feel real sick, right? Or if you've exercised, if you exercised to the point where you feel like you're going to puke, like you're going to vomit, then you've exceeded, okay, the capacity of your heart. Your heart isn't able to keep up with you. So you have what we call a, um, um, what's the name of the valve, uh, the nerve? I remember the name of the nerve in a bit. The, the nerve stimulates your stomach to want to send stuff back, okay? Uh, because you, you've, uh, your heart cannot keep up with you. So you feel short of breath, right? And you have to stop. So it's really important that you start slow, okay? Start slow, walking, brisk walking, jogging, running, and so on, okay, before you actually start, you know, going hard in your body, it's not used to it. But the good thing is that your heart is a muscle, and muscles uh, have memory. They remember everything how, you know, if you if you uh, lift weights, you know, 20 pounds every day, 20 pounds, next thing you know, your muscles are already like, oh, you know, it's 20 pounds, like, that's no big deal. 20 pounds. You, 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 your exercise is not giving you any returns, you're like, my arms aren't growing, or I'm not losing weight. Why? Because your body's going to be, uh, remember that. So you have to trick it every time. You have to do something different. You can't do the same thing over and over because it's not going to work anymore. So enough about exercise. So again, the cardiac cycle is composed of two phases, two phases, right? What are those two phases called? We have systole and diastole. Systole is referred to as the contractile part, the contractile phase of the, of the, of the cardiac cycle. Your not just your left ventricle, but all your, your, both of your ventricles are going to contract, okay? And your atria also contract. Your atria and your ventricles are going to contract. So they're all pushing blood to their respective areas, right? The atria push it to the, to the ventricles, right? The left ventricle pushes to the, to the body and the right ventricle pushes it to the lungs. So they're all working at the same time. This is a systolic phase, the contractile phase. Now, the other uh, phase is called a diastole. Some people call it the resting phase. It's not necessarily resting, all right? Your heart is actually stretching and filling, all right? So your heart muscle has to have the ability to stretch, stretch, okay? And then contract. It has to have that, um, you know, that, 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 that ability to like, boom, you know, push the blood out. Stretch, kind of like a, like a rubber band, right? Or like if you inflate a balloon, right? And then, you know, you inflate it, and then you let it go, right? You let the air out, it pushes the air out. It doesn't just like let it go out. It kind of pushes it out, right? You let go of the balloon, you see the balloon going all over the place. So you inflate it, inflates with blood and then boom, it pushes it out. That is uh, diastole and then systole. Diastole and systole. So when people get older, the heart, uh, the heart efficiency becomes less and less. The heart is able, it stretches less, and contracts with less strength. Stretches less and contracts with less strength. What do we call this? We call this congestive heart failure, okay? Congestive heart failure is a, it's a cardiac, uh, chronic problem that occurs usually with age, sometimes uh, caused by, most commonly actually caused by hypertension, high blood pressure over many, many years. You had high blood pressure forever, your heart will eventually lose its ability to stretch and contract as good as it was when you were younger. So that's why um, congestive heart failure is one of the most common problems that we deal with. And we see it happening a lot with, um, with older adults. So the signs and symptoms and all that, we'll go into that later, what, how we can help people with congestive heart failure, all right? So uh, what is a cardiac cycle? Please understand what that is. We've gone over it, I think, a few times. How are diastole and systole different from one another? Well, they're very different, okay? Contract, systole is contraction. Diastole is stretching and filling, all right? There is pressure, pressure building up. So we call it the diastolic pressure. Now, uh, yesterday I mentioned sometimes um, people get worried about their diastolic pressure. It, it is important um, when it becomes too low, but the parameters for, what are the parameters? What are the parameters for systolic blood pressure? Can somebody tell me? Uh, type in your answer. Uh, give me the the um, the parameters for systolic pressure for adults and also for diastolic pressure. You have to know those by memory, like 
like those of you that have gone through a nurse assistant course, you'd already know the parameters for systolic and diastolic pressure. If not, it's on the chapter one. All right. So again, cardiac cycle, super, super important to, um, to be able to uh, determine what is uh, abnormal. Now, I haven't gone into the, the arteries, the coronary circulation, okay, but it's very, very important. You have some major ones, major vessels in the in this part of the heart, okay, in the left uh, ventricle for the most part, and they're also on the back side of the heart, okay? So uh, one of the main ones that we have here, arteries. Remember, arteries bring uh, oxygenated and nutrients to the muscle, okay? So arteries. Uh, one of the main ones that we have is your, your right um, coronary arteries, actually on the left, I mean, that, uh, left descending, left descending arteries, left circumflex, circumflex circle, think about circle, it goes around and into the backside of the heart, okay, so left descending, okay, it's one of the main arteries that branches off into other arteries, so many people that have heart disease, coronary artery disease, uh, they get plaque, right, build up inside the arteries, okay, right here, and this is very fixable. Some people get it here and there and there and everywhere. Now, if you have plaque develop in one of the distal arteries, like way down here, that's not fixable. It's not fixable, it's too far, like they're too small, okay? What they can do is probably um, attach another artery here, you know, and bypass it over here and attach it. But if you have here, like close to the heart, to the main uh, branches, what they can do is that they can apply a stent, right? Like a, like, oh, it opens up the artery, okay? And so that increased blood flow. Here is very important that you have good blood flow because this is what feeds the rest of it. And same thing here. So get familiar with those arteries, okay? I believe there's some exercises there uh, online that you can practice and label some of these, um, some of these uh, uh, arteries. All right, so let me see here. Ms. Janie, what are the three types of circulation that we talked about? What are the three types of circulation? Uh, transportation of blood. I know, pulmonary circulation, systemic circulation, and coronary circulation. Very good, very good. Uh, Ms. Cynthia, go ahead and type in your answer. What is cardiac output? What is cardiac output? And uh, let me see, Raquel, can you tell me the, the first vessels that branch off the aorta? I remember the aorta is this big one. The ones that branch off right away from it. What are those called? You have to know the names of those. Uh, So type in your answer or, or look it up in, in just a minute, okay? Okay, so we've talked about the gross anatomy. All right, thanks, Cynthia. The uh, cardiac output is the amount of blood being pumped out per minute, okay? We measured uh, the cardiac output per minute. Very, very important. Uh, there is a test called the um, a two, 2D echocardiogram, a 2D echo. Right, or uh, ultrasound of the heart. Some people call it an ultrasound because that's an ultrasound. Uh, you can measure um, the cardiac output. You can see, measure the, the girth the, of the muscles, the size of the chambers. You can do a lot of things with the 2D echocardiogram. And that's part of the cardiac workup. When somebody starts to experience cardiac problems, the um, physicians will order a cardiac, um, a 2D echo as part of the treatment for that person. Uh, we had a, a coworker. She's young, she's 34, around there. Uh, she was having palpitations at work and, and she was not feeling well. She passed out. So uh, she went to the doctor and, and all that. And I'm like, what's going on? You're so young, why are you having medical problems, cardiac problems like this? Well, it turned out that um, she was taking some medications, okay, and had side effects. And well, it was causing her to become very um, tachycardic, right? The, the heart pumps really fast. Uh, she was having um, palpitations. Uh, anyhow, uh, let's, uh, we covered the gross anatomy, the different parts of the heart, the cardiac cycle, which is very important. So make sure you understand that. Let's take a quick 10-minute uh, break, and we'll come right back to continue with uh, the next part of the heart, which is the, um, the conduction system of the heart. Okay, so 
Hold on a second, guys. We're in 10 minutes and we'll be right back. All right. The electrical part of the heart, okay? The electrical part of the heart, the conduction system of the heart. What makes the heart go like this? Okay, it doesn't go like contract just because it needs some kind of stimulation. Okay, some kind of a stimuli. Uh, I, I spoke about electrolytes yesterday and this is where the electrolytes come in handy or important rather, because if they're, if they're you know, if you're not getting enough uh, electrolytes or nutrition, right? You're not eating well, your body will deplete some of those electrolytes and your heart is gonna be one of the first muscles to uh, sense the, the lack of, or right, the deficiency in electrolytes and it's gonna to start to have uh, arrhythmias. So what makes the heart unique? What makes the heart unique? The heart cells, the tissue, what makes it different than any other muscle in your body? Well, number one, the cells, okay? Remember, cells make tissue, tissue make organs. Okay, so we're going back down to the cellular level. So the, the cells have this ability called automaticity. Automaticity. It, they're able to conduct an electrical um, signal all by themselves without anybody, anybody uh, initiating it. So that is the miracle of life, right? If those cells start working, then your heart is alive. Okay, one cell... Uh, touches another cell and that cell passes on and becomes like a little wave, right? Like the wave in the stadium, right? Somebody goes, hey, they go up and everybody goes up, right? And you can see the wave going up and up and up in the stadium. Kind of the same idea here in the heart. One little cell, it's all it takes to start off the whole chain reaction of uh, automaticity. So these cells have the ability to initiate an electrical impulse without being stimulated by anything else, okay? Now, when we try to shock someone back, we're trying to correct a normal rhythm. Sometimes we need that little activity. We need it. If there is zero activity, then those shocks are not indicated, all right? So the myocardium, the heartbeat relies on the ability of the myocardial cells to conduct electrical impulses. Remember, the myocardium is that part of the heart, the muscular part of the heart, if they're able to conduct electricity, then you're good, okay? If those cells are not able to conduct electricity, such as when somebody has a heart attack and the tissue dies, then you're not that well, okay? So conductivity is the ability of the heart cells to receive and transmit electrical impulses. So remember this, the heart cells must be able to conduct that electricity. And we're gonna go into the path of the heart right now. These cells are contractible, they contract, and they're very excitable, okay? Imagine um, uh, you work in a daycare, okay? And you have all these kids with ADHD and they're all quiet and they're just sitting there and they're just waiting for somebody to start, right? That's all it takes one little kid and boom, you have chaos, right? Well, in the heart, you don't have chaos, but you have excitability. Uh, excitability is, um, is what causes these cells, like they're just waiting, like, you know, like, uh, tell me, tell me what to do, you know, that's what the cells in the heart do, they're very excitable, and uh, well, it's a good thing, okay, sometimes it's not a good thing, but for the most part, it's a good thing, because we need them to be excited, and be able to, like, you know, pass on that electricity, here, you know, here you go, here you go, you know, they pass it on to all the cells that are around them, they contract them, and those cells go to the next around them, and so on, and it becomes a little chain reaction, all right, so the heart is also regulated. You can actually slow down your heart if you want to a certain degree, okay? It's mostly, um, it's mostly managed by your brain, okay? Uh, again, we, can't, we don't have the ability to completely stop it. We can try to slow it down by relaxing, slowing your breathing, slowing your breathing, and then your heart will slow down, okay? So the sympathetic system, it's the branch of the, neuro, um, uh, the neurological system. Uh, increases the heart rate and contractility by secreting norepinephrine. Norepinephrine, um, what's, the, what's the common word they use it? Uh, adrenaline. Some people call it adrenaline. Norepinephrine is what makes your heart go faster. Okay. Adrenaline. When somebody scares you or maybe um, uh, you have a, a, a sudden, uh, a bad experience or something like that, we call it the fight or flight reaction. You're like, <gasps> what do you do? Somebody scared you. You have the fight or flight reaction, your heart goes right, and then it just slows down again. So norepinephrine or adrenaline, adrenaline is what makes your um, your heart go faster. The parasympathetic uh, part of the heart, 
or the uh, neurological system, okay, exerts a depressing effect. So it's the opposite, parasympathetic. Think about para like paralyzed, okay, slows down, okay, it's a depressing effect. So we have some control over the heart, right? By thinking and slowing down. And if you actually think, tell your heart to slow down in your mind, it will slow down, okay? But you can't make it stop completely though, all right? Other factors, of course, that affect your heart are everything else, your stress, your anxiety, exercising, or lack of exercise and all these things can affect your heart, right? Fear, emotions, for the most part, can affect how your heart works, okay? The speed, with the, how fast or how slow, all right? So now that you know a little bit of the heart, right? The, some of the characteristics, okay? You might think of uh, someone like this, uh, like the cells of the heart, they're very uh, excitable. They're just waiting for something, someone to come in here. I have a stepsister like that, you know, she's all over the place. Um, and then you have your pathways for conduction. This is the very important part of the, of the heart. Now in this little model, you can't see it. It's not located, okay? Because it's not here. It's not. It's in the inner layer, okay? The pathways for conduction, you have several areas. The SA node, the sinoatrial node, the sino or atrial node, SA node, is located somewhere in your right atrium, somewhere over here, the SA node. This is your natural pacemaker. This is what starts your heart. This is your natural pacemaker. So if your heart is beating at 80 times per minute, it's your SA node. Your SA node is doing that to you, okay? So the SA node is uh, the natural pacemaker of the heart located in the upper portion of the right atrium. It is the pacemaker uh, that initiates the whole entire beat, okay? Think of it like, um, I'm not sure how you wanna uh, imagine it, but it's where everything starts. Like if you're gonna start a race, okay? You have a starting line, okay? Your SA node is the starting line, remember that. As you know, it's tissue, it's cells in there, okay? It's not like a little device or anything. It's like a, a group of cells, okay? They call the SA node, like four of you. Let's say you guys, all four of you are your are the SA node, okay? Or let's say Janie is the SA node, and then I'm going to give you guys a, a title. So the SA node is the first one that fires, boom. Where does that signal go? Oh, it's going to travel to the left side. Yeah, that way, this left. And then it also gonna travel this way. Remember I said that the heart is like this, okay? Kind of like that. The signal is gonna travel to the left, but also this way, left and downward. Like around, if you imagine a clock, like around uh, five o'clock, also my own. Six is down here, five, four, three. So around there, this way. So the signal travels from here, that way, and that way, at the same time, at the same time, okay? So remember that. The signal from the SNO travels left and also downward and to the, and to the left, this way, towards your left leg. All right, so that is how the SA node, the signal travels. So imagine every little cell here stimulated and then to the left, every little cell stimulated. And then down here, every cell in the myocardium is stimulated and they're all doing this, getting ready to contract, they're expanding and boom, and they contract. So every, this is what's happening when the SA node, this, the signal is traveling down. Uh, where does it travel to? It has a special road, a special highway, all right? Uh, we call it uh, here in the right atrium, we have um, uh, an area called Bachman's Bundle, okay? Bachman's Bundle. This is the, the, a, a special tissue that takes that signal from the SA node is gonna take it down to the next section, okay? Okay, let's imagine we're, um, we're in a bus, we're all gonna ride in the bus. It's called the SA bus, the Sino SA node bus. We're gonna travel into it, okay? We're on the bus, the signal goes, boom, through the Bachmann's bundle, and it's gonna travel down to a, another uh, bus station, okay? This station is called the AV node, the atrioventricular node. This uh, bus station is where we're gonna hold on for like a tenth of a second. We're gonna make a super short stop, okay, at the AV node, and then we're gonna continue through a narrow pathway called the bundle of his, bundle of his, okay? This is another type of uh, tissue that conducts electricity, okay? SA node, Bagmas bundle, bundle of his, and then, I mean, AV node, and then bundle of his, okay? SA node, Bagmas bundle, AV node, 
And then the little section, there's a tiny road called the bundle of his. Okay, it's a little expressway. Once the signal comes down to the, bu to the bundle of his, it's gonna have to make a decision. Is it gonna go left or is it gonna go right? Okay, this, um, this is where your left and your right ventricles are stimulated, right? At the same time, but the signal is going to spread to the left side and also to the right side. So you have branches, right? Like roads, you're gonna take a left, you're gonna take a right. So the signal travels at the same time to the left bundle branch and also to the right bundle branch. So these, these um, chambers, the right and the left ventricles are going to be stimulated, right? They're gonna be stretching, 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 and then boom, contract. Diastole and then systole diastole and then systole okay this is where the where the what's happening the signal that came from the sa node is stimulating the cells the tissue of the muscle right to be to start stretching and then contract okay this the electrical activity of the heart is what makes your heart uh, stretch and contract without that stimulation your heart is still Remember, so what happens in cardiac arrest? There is no electrical activity. That means that the heart has stopped. So we're not in cardiac arrest, right? We're well and alive. That means our hearts right now are being stimulated by electrical activity, right? Started by the SA node. Now, as the signal continues into the left and the right ventricles, okay? Travels down here and these are getting excited. All these cells are getting really, really excited. The signal has to travel deep into the muscle not just on the, on, the, on the top, but deep into the muscle through the, what we call the Purkinje fibers. Purkinje fibers, you can imagine them like roots taking the signal down into the muscle, okay? These signals stimulating the entire uh, myocardium, okay? And if you go in even deeper, you, you'll find some um, fiber tissue called fascicles. Fascicles are the smallest roots of electrical conduction system, all right? So you can imagine the, the electrical conduction pathway getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets deep into the muscle. We call those fascicles, all right? So if you imagine uh, someone in having a heart attack, okay, on this part of the heart, right? The, the one of the left uh, arteries is clogged with plaque, okay? And then there's the blood flow and then that tissue starts to die, okay? The whole tissue dies. That includes the fascicles, the Purkinje fibers, and anything around it because of lack of blood flow. So when there's more signal coming in, how is it gonna go through it? It can't because it's dead. So it's gonna have to go around it, okay? So you see changes in the, in the EKG. Okay, that's why it's important to understand the conduction pathway, all right? SA node, um, the uh, bundle branches, I'm sorry, not the bundle branches, the Bogman's bundle, and then you have your AV node, and you have the bundle of his, and then you have your left and your right bundle branches, which divide further into your Purkinje fibers and then your fascicles. So anything that affects circulation to the muscle will affect the fibers or the conduction system. So you see abnormal EKGs coming along, all right? So make sure you're familiar with a, with a different part, okay, of the heart. Now, another important thing is that the, you know how we have a heart rate right, between 60 to 100? Well, we have that because of the SA node. That is the normal pacemaker. Your SA node fires between 60 to 100, okay? As we continue down the pathway in the AV node, the AV node fires uh, 40 to 60, if I'm not mistaken, 40 to 60 beats per minute. So it gets slower and slower and slower and slower. Your ventricles themselves can actually start, be try to take over. If this fails, then this takes over. If this fails, then the ventricle will take over. Now the ventricles can only contract about 40 beats per minute. So we'll go into that later, okay? Because every cell in your heart has the ability to be a pacemaker. That's another important thing, right? But the captain of the pacemakers is your SA node. Nobody goes over this one unless this one fails. If this one dies, then then other cells are gonna start to take over and we'll see some of those arrhythmias when that happens. So, um, <clears throat> make sure you know the parts of the conduction system. Very, very important. Okay, know the characteristics, okay, of the, um, of the cells. Remember their aut automaticity, okay? They're able to conduct an electrical um, signal. Very important that you know that. 
All right, it's electrical stimulation and the EKG waveform. There's two terms that I really want you to remember, two terms. Pol uh, depolarization, depolarization and repolarization. Okay, they sound just almost just the same. Okay, but they mean completely different. Okay, so um, polarization, what it means is that the cells are at their peak resting energy. Okay, so right now, you guys are polarized. Why? Because it's morning and you have the highest amount of energy at this time. So you guys are polarized, you're ready for the day, right? So you guys are right now are polarized. Think of it. Your cells, your cardiac cells are polarized, you are polarized, okay? Now, what is it gonna take for you to start moving, to start doing action? Well, something's gonna stimulate you, right? Well, let's say you know you had to be online for class, okay? So that thing stimulated you to get up and go, okay? So you've been depolarized, okay? You've been depolarized, you've been put into action. So when cardiac cells are put into action, mean they were depolarized, right? Think of the cells, they're just here waiting around, like waiting on, you know, all, uh, all hyperactive. They're like, okay, what do I do, what do I do? And, and then they get the signal from this, you know, boom, okay, and then they start working, all right? So think of it that way. The cells have to get depolarized to start the, the motion of the contraction, okay, of the cardiac cycle rather, okay? So once when the cells are depolarized, they emit energy. You're going to see some energy, some little EKG waveforms, right? Well, because the cells were depolarized and they released energy. That's the energy that Dr. Augusta discovered, okay, and that was later traced with the EKG when it was invented. So cells are depolarized, meaning they're in action, okay? Now, we call that also systole. When the cells are, when the, when the ventricles are contracting, right? Or the chambers are contracting, we call it systole, meaning the cells have been depolarized and they are in contraction phase, okay? So cells have been depolarized and it means that, boom, they're contracting, okay? So now eventually they have to come right back to the resting site. That means they are getting repolarized, re-energized, re-energized, resting or re-energized. I don't like the word resting because it means that the heart's doing nothing like just sitting around, but it's not the case. Your heart is actually getting re-energized. Think about, you know, exercising, take a little breather, right? Get some air, get some Gatorade in you, get repolarized. And then you're ready once again to get, boom, depolarized. Repolarized, okay? So think of it that way if you want to, or think of a way that helps you remember the uh, electric electrical stimulation of the heart. Now, why do you have to know that, right? Because it's going to help you uh, identify, right? Uh, what's going on in the electrical conduction pathway, what's going on in the heart when um, during the different phases of the EKG. All right, so the EKG waveform is recorded, right, from the electrical activity produced during depolarization and repolarization. That's what we see in the EKG. All right, and so on. So we'll look at them. We have different parts of the EKG, different parts of the EKG. Um, we have little waveforms, right? We have the P wave. Okay, we have the P wave, which is the little bump. Okay, the little upward bump. The very first one is called the P wave, P wave. And then after the P wave, we have a little interval. An interval is kind of like a break, right? Like, a, yeah, like a little break. Like if you go to a show, sometimes like a, a live show and they take a little interval, like a little break, that's what it means, okay? So they have the P wave, okay? And then there's a little interval. What does the P wave mean? It means that what part of the heart is being depolarized? The right atriums, both the right and the left have been depolarized. Y'all need to be writing this down or committed to memory. There is a table on page 42. You can see it and explains to you exactly what I'm talking about right now, okay? So right now the essay note fired, the right atrium and the left atrium are getting depolarized, meaning they, they, they've gotten um, that signal, hey, let's get, let's get to work, all right? They've been depolarized and they're beginning to contract, 
okay? They're getting put into action. So <clears throat> that is what the P wave means. And then there's that little interval, okay? That little break, a period of time between two activities, right? So we have the P wave, the atria getting depolarized, and then we're gonna have a very small dip in the line. Okay, so if you want, if you want to draw this, you can draw it on, you know, on there. I think you can actually do this here somewhere. Mm, nope. Mm, nope. Nope. Mm. I know there's a whiteboard I can use in here somewhere, but I don't know where. I never used it. So, anyways, draw a little bump like this, and then a little very small interval, and then a little dip. We call that um, a Q, a Q wave. The little dips. What it means is that the energy that was released drops for that very very small microsecond. It drops. Okay. So remember, we're talking about the P wave is what the atria. And then you see that big spike, what everybody sees, that big spike, boom, that is your R wave, R. That big peak looks like a little Christmas tree, that is your R wave, okay? And remember, they're always positive, always positive, right? Meaning they're always pointing up, they're not always negative. If it's negative, there's a problem where you're looking at a different uh, view of the heart, okay? So. Is it the same from a video on chapter one? Hmm. I'm not sure. What are you talking about, Janie? Uh, it could be. It could be. I might have placed. I might have placed a video there uh, about the EKG, right? Uh, I do have videos on there, but I'm not right there's now. There's a there's a picture on page forty three. Okay, yeah, there's a, exactly the, on the next page, right? So you can look at it there, but I'm trying to explain to you, right? Um, maybe it helps a little bit the way I explain it uh, versus viewing uh, a picture, right? Because you can see the picture and it's like, well, what does it mean, right? So I'm trying to relate it. Yeah, right? there's a video that you shared that it explains everything. It's there? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so that and me explaining here and hopefully, uh, you know, reading the book can help you understand what this is, okay? Because you, this is your foundation. This is what you, the knowledge that you have to know so that when you look at an EKG, you can tell it's like, oh, this man's having some atrial fibrillation or some ventricular tachycardia or, you know, uh, some kind of arrhythmia. So this is why, because you have to know this, the, the, the conduction pathway. So the P wave is your atrial contracting, okay? Then the signal continues down, right? Through the Bachmann's bundle and to the AV node, it's very, very little. And uh, that's where you see the little notch. And then you have your R wave, which is the big, right? The big tall wave. That is the ventricles contracting. The ventricles are much larger than your atria, your right ventricle and your left ventricle. They're much larger, so they emit more energy. So boom, all this energy comes up, right? So you see the R wave. That's why it's taller than all the rest of them because of the mass of the heart. So imagine somebody that has a very large heart, they're gonna have a very large R wave, okay? Somebody perhaps with a, uh, what we call a ventricular hypertrophy. I know it's like a fancy word, but a ventricular hyper means high, right? Uh, trophy means a, a change or enlargement. So someone with ventricular hypertrophy, maybe from uh, having high blood pressure for many, many years can develop that. But anyways, the left and right ventricle are your R wave, when they're contracting, they emit all this energy and you see an R wave, okay? And then for a very microsecond, you're gonna go into repolarization, re-energizing, right? So you're gonna have your S wave. S is the little line that drops right below what we call the isometric line. So we have the isometric line, P wave, Q, R, and then it drops a little bit below that line. We call it the isometric line. That is your S wave. That's when repolarization begins. That is when your ventricles are again re-energizing, right? S. And then you have a T wave at the end. That means repolarization is complete. That means the break is over. Okay. You're like, 
T wave will breaks over. Damn it. Okay, we start again, right? Your your uh, uh, SA node will fire once again, and you have your P wave, and so on. And the cycle continues, right? Seventy beats per minute on average. Okay. So yes, page forty three. It explains to you exactly what it is. Now, why do you see two like a little cone? Because one line represents the left ventricle and the other line represents the right ventricle, all right? So that is why, and the P wave, the little bump that you see, half of the P, half of the P wave is the right atrium and the other half is the left atrium, okay? So boom, left and right, or left and right and left, whatever. And then Q, R, and then the little S falls, and then you have your T wave, okay? So the T wave. So that is the um, pathway, okay, of the electricity that goes, that happens in your heart. So it's important that you remember that, understand it, okay? What part of the heart is working when you see R wave? What part of the heart is working when you see the T wave? What's happening with, with, uh, in the T wave form, all right? So again, it's very, very important that you know this uh, cycle by memory, okay? When you come here next week, uh, we're, by the way, we're gonna meet, um, did I say next Wednesday or Friday? Uh, let's make it Friday, guys, okay? Next Friday. Let me type it here. Uh, what's gonna be next Friday? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. On the 15th of uh, January, we're going to meet here in class, okay? By then, we should already um, learned about the um, performing an AKG, so y'all can start uh, practicing, okay? You learn about the machine first, and then we're going to uh, do some EKGs on each other, all right? So on page 44, you also see a the EKG waveform and the activity, okay? There's intervals, and then there's segments. There's little segments. So those also are affected. Sometimes there's a, a problem in the heart that affects, that delays the signal. For some reason, it, it's, it's getting there, it's taking there longer. Now we're talking about tenths of a second. It's taking there longer. It should have been there like in one tenth of a second, one night taking, you know, one and a half tenths of a second, whatever you call that. So you're gonna see it, we're gonna measure, which by the way, reminds me, you are going to have to um, get some calipers, okay? Uh, you can go to a store anywhere you like. Uh, no, no, not no, really. You can't just get them in a store. I have some um, calipers that you're going to need to measure the EKG waveforms, okay? So either you buy it on your on your own. They're called uh, EKG calipers, uh, or you can buy them from me. I think I have them. I sell them for like ten bucks. Uh, I have blue, pink, and black, and yeah, blue, pink, and black. Uh, so you can measure the EKG waveforms, okay? That's um, the most accurate way to measure an EKG waveform. We're going to learn um, the paper. When you see the the EK, the 12 lead EKG, it, it comes in a paper, sometimes red, sometimes green, and it has all of these little squares. It's divided into very small squares. Well, each square is uh, has a measurement, and we're going to learn about that in the next chapter. So hopefully today you've learned, okay, about the... Um, the conduction system, the main parts of the heart, okay? The the action, the cardiac cycle, which is very important, and uh, the waveforms. Go ahead and complete the assignments um, today. Chapter two, has anybody attempted chapter two test already? Has anybody gotten ahead? If not, you have uh, this weekend to complete it. Uh, it will close on Monday, so make sure you complete chapter two test uh, by Monday. Um, and the assignments, obviously, as well. Does anyone have any questions on the EKG? If not, I'm going to start asking questions. Sir, on um, mine, the chapter two test, it closes on tomorrow. On Saturday. Oh, really? Okay, we'll yes. make sure I change that right now. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, we have about 10 more minutes. So let's go ahead and uh, do some questions, okay? So, Ms. Janie. What what does the P wave represent? 
What does a P wave represent? What's happening in the heart when the P wave, the little P wave? Uh, depolarization. Yes, but what depolarization? What part of the heart is being depolarized? Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia answered it for you. The atria, atria, plural, meaning both, right? Not just one, atrium is one, but atria is two. So both the left and the right atria are being depolarized. Very good. Thank you, Cynthia. All right, Ms. Raquel, what, is, what does depolarization mean? What does that mean? Like if you've been depolarized, what does that mean? Um, the cells of the heart, like when they What's happening to the cells? When they contract. Okay, it's before the contraction happens. What is happening to the cells before they contract? They're being what? They've been what? Stimulated. Stimulated. So cellular stimulation. So the cells are getting stimulated. They're getting all excited. There's a party. Where, 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 where? They're getting stimulated. So that's what's happening in depolarization. Okay. Uh, Norma, what is happening in repolarization? What does repolarization mean? What is happening in cellular repolarization? Is Norma here? Yes, I'm here. Oh. You can find it on page 41. So right now we said they're being stimulated, right? The cells are being depolarized. So what does repolarization mean? The return. Return or you can call it cellular recovery. Cellular recovery, right? We, I don't like the word resting because the heart is never rest. The heart never rests, right? Thank God. It's recovering, re-energizing, refilling something, right? It's not just like air still sitting around, it's recovering. So depolar repolarization means recovery, okay? Very good. All right, moving on. So what is the QR QRS complex represent, Cynthia? Type in your answer, Ms. Cynthia. What is the QRS complex represent? Type in your answer. Meanwhile, um, Raquel, what does the T wave represent? The T wave. Uh, Repolarization. Of? The vent ventic, I can't say it, ventricular. The ventricles. Yes. Ventricular repolarization. What does that mean? Can you explain to me in simple words? What is happening to the ventricles? It's, uh, they're, not relaxing, but um, I think we just said the word, right? We just said the word. Recovering, the recovering, right? The uh, the ventricles are recovering in the, in the T wave, okay? And yes, that's correct, Miss Cynthia. The uh, QRS represents ventricular depolarization. What does depolarization mean, uh, Janie? What is happening to the ventricles if they're being depolarized? Explain to me in simple words, like if we were telling someone else that doesn't know. What does ventricular depolarization mean? That sounds very fancy, right? It sounds like, wow, what the heck are you talking about? Like, you sound smart. What is ventricular depolarization? How can you explain it to someone? in simple terms. Anyone? It means the ventricles are being stimulated, right? Stimulated or right before, stimulated and then contracted right? Stimulate it and contract it. That is ventricular depolarization. 
Okay. So again, see those two terms sound almost the same, but they mean completely different, right? completely different things. So you make sure that you understand those. Right? We have atrial depolarization and then atrial repolarization. We have ventricular depolarization, right? They get stimulated and then they recover our repolarization, right? So this happens, right? Uh, simultaneously, the atria does their thing, pushes blood to the ventricles, and then the ventricles do the same thing, right? Ventri uh, the atria pushes the blood to the ventricles, the ventricles receive it, and then boom. At the same time, these are doing the same things, okay? They're working at the same time, all the time, 24-7. So what can affect your heart, really? What, what can really damage your heart? Um, ischemia, ischemia or lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen can really do a number on your heart. It's gonna panic. Your heart's gonna, what's going on? Where is it? Where's my oxygen? Where's my blood flow? Ischemia, sounds like, I don't know, like somebody's bad, like a bad name for someone. Are you ischemia? No, I'm not ischemia. Uh, ischemia occurs when there's a sudden loss of reduction in blood supply or oxygen to the, to the heart muscle. Mainly your heart is very sensitive to that, okay? It has very sensitive emotions. It gets pissed off right away. So if there's any lack of blood flow to the heart, it's gonna get really upset and it's gonna start pumping like, it's, like it wants to explode, okay? Now, if there is no oxygen, right, for a prolonged time, there's gonna be something called an infarct. Infarct mean, means tissue death. The tissue around that area where there's no oxygen or blood flow, it's gonna die. It's gonna die. It's going to form a little black spot okay and we can actually see that in the ekg someone that had a heart attack they never knew we can tell in the ekg that is um what we call the uh the q wave the q wave the one little notch that goes down okay so when you look at an ekg guys when you see an ekg you see all the little waves you know they're upward they're pointing upward p q r s and then t they all have an upward right sometimes you're going to see that the shape is going to be a little crooked, a little weird, right? The the QRS is going to look not like it has a little, like it's going to look like a little mountain. That's not normal, okay? So you're going to start to see different looking EKGs. And you're like, what's that? Why is that happening? Most of the time it happens because there's been ischemia followed by an infarct. It means someone had a heart attack, okay? Not a fart, an infarct. I-N-F-A-R-C-T. That means the tissue died, okay? Once tissue dies in your heart, it's gone. That's it. You cannot repair it. Now, in your heart, we this is the only part. You know, you all know, you've heard how lizards are able to regrow their tails, right? Have you all heard of that? Um, well, your heart is the only place where we have uh, something called angio, angiogenesis and new arteries new arteries form around that tissue death, right? They form around, this is the only place in your body that you can regenerate new arteries. We call it angiogenesis. And that of course is a sign that you had a heart attack, okay? If you have angiogenesis or we call collateral circulation, uh, you had a heart attack at some point, you may not even have known it, okay? Um, let me see, I have a quick question. I think I guys already asked you pretty much. I hope you have a good understanding. I hope this helped you. I hope I explained it simple enough for you to understand and watch those videos. And uh, as we continue, okay, we, we're building on this knowledge. Okay, we're building on this knowledge. Uh, when we get to the arrhythmias, when we get to the arrhythmias, uh, you're going to be able to understand and see only if you have this knowledge right now. If you don't know, if you don't get chapter two, guys, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. And by the way, once we make it into the arrhythmias, you're going to be um, needing uh, index cards, index cards. I'm going to have you all do index cards on, uh, on each arrhythmia, okay? And then you're going to tell me about the arrhythmia when we meet in class, okay? So again, please make sure uh, you look for some calipers. Uh, if not, I'll have some here for sale and uh, some index cards. All right. It's going to be super, super important. Okay. So with that. Uh, I'm and gonna... all of that's for Friday? 
Uh, yeah, you can bring it for next Friday. Okay. Yeah. I'll have them here. Este, and we'll talk about those, uh, about the, the wires, you know, what they are on Monday. Okay. So you're going to already know what the wires are, what they mean, where they go and all that kind of stuff. Okay. There's also videos on there that you can watch. So that it tells you exactly how are you going to place the wires. So make sure you watch those. So they have a good idea of uh, how to attach them. Very, very, very simple procedure. Like it's super easy to do. It's easier than phlebotomy. It's easier than anything. But again, uh, evaluating the AKG, we're going to be doing a 12 lead AKG. Okay. You're going to, you're going to know what that means uh, on Monday. All right. So Make sure you. Uh, That's keep... the one with the different the uh, twelve images, the different. Um... Yeah, there's uh, some samples on there that I put on there, este, and uh, make sure you um, you you watch them, okay? And I'll explain everything on Monday, uh, what they are, what each wire does, and how the signals are represented on the paper and all that. So we're building on the knowledge, guys. Uh, right now, you've learned today the anatomy of the heart, the different parts, uh, the cardiac cycle, which is very important. And also the um, the electrical conduction system of the heart itself. So see, we have the motor function, the mechanical function, and then we have the electrical. So we have two parts. Without the electrical, there is no mechanical function. Okay. All right. So I have nothing else unless you have any questions. I'm pretty much done. And we can we're going to uh, meet again on Monday at the same time. Anybody have any questions? Just go ahead and email me. For now. I'll see you on Monday. Have a good weekend and stay safe.